to the bad, dirty, filthy, foul, vile, vulgar, coarse, in poor taste, unseemly, street talk, gutter talk, locker room language, barracks talk, body, naughty, saucy, raunchy, rude, crude, lewd, lascivious, indecent, profane, obscene, blue, off color, risque, suggestive, cursin', cussin', swear in nature of this blissful episode, listener discretion is advised. Okay, so HBO featured a lot of comedy, different types of comedy specials. One of the uh, ongoing series that they had was their Young Comedians, which showcased stand-up comedians who performed routines that later ended up, in a lot of cases, becoming TV shows that were based around their routines. Also, Comedy Central showed clips of the comedians on their short attention span theater, which I have to tell you, I do not remember short attention span theater at all, but as we were saying earlier, Michigan didn't get Comedy Central for the longest time, so I was deprived. at, (laughs) At the beginning of Comedy Central, when it first started, they had very little programming, so they would have... Comedy Central was almost like MTV, but for comedians. They would take three and four minute segments of stand up routines and play them like they were music videos and then have like people who were like VJs or something uh, introducing the clips. And HBO owned Comedy Central, so a lot of their stuff wound up on Comedy Central. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So, um, one of the first folks and another one of my favorites we have a clip from is uh, Drew Carey, who had the Drew Carey show. All right, I'm glad to be here, man. I'm in a great mood. I had some terrible news in the mail lately. I got uh, my high school reunion coming up. I don't know if you've ever been to one of those. Don't go. It's uh, too much pressure, man. That's a lot of stress, high school reunion. You get that letter in the mail, and right away you feel like you only have six months to make something of yourself. <laughs> like, come on, seven. Daddy needs to lose weight and get a new career. Come on. I'm the only one that still looks like his graduation picture, though, so I'm pretty happy. I know it's funny and everything, I just don't think looking like this is worth that one joke. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, I... <laughs> so this I did, we didn't know, we didn't know this, but Drew Carey started on Star Search. And we Wait, saw... we found this out. Well, I don't know if he started, but he did appear on Star Search and hopefully he, he won those rounds. I think he because... won. I think he did win, <laughs> but I don't think he was a... I don't think he was a finalist. Oh, that's a shame. I, we that's know a couple a of people were on Star Search, like, for instance, well, Sinbad got his start on uh, on the comedian Sinbad, not the mythic uh, character. Yes, um, thank you. Ed McMahon's not that old. And also Destiny's Child, I believe, started on Star Search as well. So here's a, per, a, a TMI tidbit about Drew Carey. So when I was pregnant with Regan, we used to watch reruns of the Drew Carey show all the time, and we also used to watch him hosting... The American version oh, of Whose Line, line is, is It anyway? anyway? Featuring characters from that show as well. So like constantly during the, when I was waiting for Regan, uh, we, I was always watching that. So I decided that Regan was going to come out thinking that Drew Carey was her father. She was like, it's the voice of my daddy. And she used to, yeah, you know what? If we can just, we got to do that. We got to have a triggering effect with Regan and see if that, that actually happens. <laughs> we'll play some Drew Carey. And if she's like in the middle of something and she just stops and looks up. <laughs> Like a curious dog. What was that sound? That sounds familiar. But I can't believe she even heard you through all that hiccuping that she did. Yeah. Anyway, getting back on track. um, So we're talking about American sitcoms here? Comedians who played fictionalized versions of uh, themselves in their own comedy. Um, did Grace Under Fire? I never watched that. Brett Butler. Brett I didn't Butler. watch it. It was very, <laughs> it, uh, it was a very popular show. But I was working most of the time that it was on. Just the same with Ellen as well. Ellen was on, and I never really watched it. Although I do remember we didn't, we uh, we turned on the episode where she came out of the closet or something. I remember watching that. Oh, okay. At at work, uh, because it was a big monumentous thing. Right. Uh, we have Tim Allen in Home Improvement. Right. He did his shtick when he was like doing uh, his stand-up. It was like, rah, 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 rah. he used to do that all the time and talk about how he was trying to be good <laughs> so, with tools and everything. And I guess... I don't, this one doesn't fit. You've got Mad About You, but that's not really Paul Reiser's fictionalized version of himself. That's just a regular old actor playing a character. But he so, wrote it. He oh, wrote okay. It I didn't quite know he was that. Part, like, like Anything But Love, also Richard Lewis. I never, you know, Richard Lewis and Paul Reiser, I gotta say, and Tim Allen to some extent. I never, I, I did, I did watch Brett Butler's stand up. I like, I liked her. I thought she was really funny. Unfortunately, she had substance abuse problems and then had a nervous breakdown on her show and they canceled it. Uh, and then what happened after that? I guess she cleaned up a little bit, but 
But I never really got into Tim Allen or Paul Reiser or uh, or Richard or Lewis. Richard Lewis, Richard Lewis sure. is like his uh, his shtick is the whiny Jew. He does this a lot, and the thing is, I mean, like Jerry Seinfeld does it better. Larry David did it better, even though Richard Lewis was on Larry David's show. He's always talking about going into therapy and stuff, and then a lot of this stuff is very kind of Woody Allenish, but really, really whiny about it, you know. Uh, Everybody loves Raymond. Ray Romano, yeah, that's I, that's one of those shows I saw in reruns, but it's a super funny show. Is all I can really say. It had, yeah, it, it had its moments, and also you know Peter Boyle. Peter Boyle. What can I say? Yeah, the guy who plays his brother, whose name I can't remember, is a very funny person. Oh God, Brad Garrett. Brad Garrett. Yeah. He's the guy with the voice that sounds like this. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, so we've got a two for here with Gary Shandling because he had It's Gary Shandling Show. Which was a, a, a really, really funny show. I like the theme song the best, but we're not getting that in the clip. I, you know what? Was, it, was, it, was, it was considered groundbreaking, actually, just as much as Larry Sanders was. Uh, um, but he would constantly address the audience. He would even, like, tell you when the show was over. He would actually come out, you know, I mean, like, they would be in the middle of their whatever gag. And he did this on Saturday Night Live when he guest, guest uh, hosted the show. He would say, okay, show, okay, folks, that's the end of the show. And everybody applauds. It was just hilarious. But here's a bit from Gary Shandling. This is one of his early stand-ups. Nice to be here. I love coming to Las Vegas. I got in late last night about 11 o'clock and ate at a Burger King because the gambling thing just didn't work out the way I'd hoped, you know what I mean? So I'm eating there. I'm the only person in the Burger King, right? There's no one else in there, and there's one girl behind the counter. That's it in the whole place, me and her, right? I said, I'd like a cheeseburger, please. She leans over into the microphone that's there and says, one cheeseburger, and she walked back to the kitchen to make it. <laughs> <laughs> Who was she talking to, you know? I'm trying to figure this out. Then I was eating health food the other day. I'm in a health food restaurant. There's a woman changing her baby's diaper at the next table. Because she thinks it's a natural thing to do, you know, and it's not. I don't want to see this when I'm eating, you know. Breastfeeding, I like to watch. I enjoy that. <laughs> I'll be going, next, please. Thank you. I don't want to see that. You see, parents think everything their babies do is cute. Am I right? I have a friend. He has a 16-month-old baby. I'm having dinner at his house. The baby's crawling around on the carpet. The baby loaded up its diaper there. And the mother actually said, isn't that adorable? Brandon made a gift for Daddy. <laughs> now I'm sitting there figuring this guy's got to be real easy to shop for on Father's Day. <laughs> I know what to get him. I know what to get this guy. Go ahead, Frank. Open it up. Go ahead. Go ahead. I've made it myself. Go ahead, Frank. <laughs> now he's very similar to Jerry Seinfeld in that way. He's earlier. This is earlier than Seinfeld. This is probably about five or six years earlier than Jerry Seinfeld, but. Same kind of style, like a conversational thing. They do, they both do that, did you ever notice stuff. <laughs> right, um, okay. And then um, his, the show that was even more popular than, that, than the Gary Shandling show is the Larry Sanders show. That was one of those that lots of people talked about for a while. This is a parody, this is unusual. It's a parody of a late night talk show, obviously Johnny Carson or, or Letterman or something like that, right? right? Mm -hmm. And it's done in a single camera format, which became very popular and led to other single camera format cinematic type comedy shows like Arrested Development. Uh, Modern Family, which I've never seen, but I've heard good things about, but I'm not really into that anymore. Um... So this bit is with uh, uh, Arrested Development's own Jeffrey Tambor playing Hank, of course, as we know. Hank, have you ever had a dog? <laughs> Hank has had a dog. <clears throat> okay. Well, I thought you might have, uh, in fact, had a dog. I thought you... Actually, a... um, Doctor, maybe you, maybe you could help me out. Uh, my dog, um, Felipe. Felipe? <laughs> yes. I did not recall that. Yes, Felipe Xavier Kingsley. <laughs> I see. Yes, well, uh, anyway, uh, doctor, my dog Felipe has a particular problem. He uh, can never stop mm, uh, licking himself. <laughs> I believe that's uh, learned behavior, uh, Hank, when you stop, the dog will stop. It's that old uh, monkey see, monkey do. Well, I've got to, I, 
something has to give because uh, he used to uh, lick himself and then uh, kiss, kiss me on the face. Oh, boy. I couldn't, uh, I would just cut out the middleman there and uh, lick him. By the way, none of this is covered in my book. <laughs> well, I think it sounds like a good chapter. It might improve the sales. But if the, uh, uh, sometimes I would have a lady come back uh, to the house. Sometimes is the key phrase on the lady. <laughs> and uh, Felipe would put his nose in a, how do you say this on television, an, an awkward place. And, do you understand what I'm saying? With uh, her, and he hadn't even met her. Yeah, cutting into Hank's action, in effect. In, indeed, in, indeed he is. But the, uh, the woman always says, oh, that's okay. He doesn't know what he's doing. And I'm thinking, uh, maybe I ought to get a dog costume. <laughs> Listen, Hank, if you call our office of Actors and Others for Animals, we can get you neutered for a very low cost. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that whole exchange, that back and forth, is very Bob Newhart. I've noticed it's, a, it's kind of like deadpan humor and reaction. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. So that brings us to the next on our list, which is Newhart, which unfortunately you don't have a clip from. Newhart has got to be one of my all-time favorite shows, and I can just remember um, just sitting there, just laughing very hard when I was a teenager or whatever, or maybe younger than a teenager. I don't remember kid much it. about Newhart except uh, what it was. Uh, Peter Scolari was he in it? He was in it. He was it, in yeah. it, right? And mm -hmm. he was from Bosom Buddies with Tom Hanks, which was one of the funniest shows that apparently nobody cared about back when it was on, but. It, you know, it got Tom Hanks a career. But it was, yeah, anyway, New Heart was definitely that kind of show where he's reacting to the crazy characters around him, including the, he, the famous Larry, Daryl and Daryl. Yes, in Vermont. It was an inn in Vermont that he ran with his wife, and there was other well, staff Mary members Fran. that worked Mary with him. Mary Fran was his wife. Uh -huh. But unfortunately, for some reason, the final episode I remember, he woke up and it was a dream. Where he, he was, was still having... married to Suzanne Suzanne's Lachette from, from the, the Bob, Bob New Heart show. show. It was a clever. Yeah. It was clever. I'll give it that. So moving on the list, we have The King of Queens, which I have never in my life seen. I've never <laughs> seen it, and it's also what's it based on a, a, a comedian as well. Yes. Uh, what was his name? I don't Kevin know. Kevin James? There you go, Kevin James. Whew, thank goodness you remember. And uh, his wife is played by Leia Romini? Yes. Yeah, her, for some reason, I know better. Leia um, Romini was uh, one of the Tortelli children, right? From, right. Um, Cheers. Cheers, yep. Yeah. And um, Ellen, which you mentioned. I mentioned that. Um, I don't know. This one doesn't really belong on the list, but Just Say Julie with Julie Brown who's like a sort of a musician comedian and played a character on Newhart. So it all connects. It all Who connects. Who was she on Newhart? She played like a, like a recurring character, not a main character. She was like a, a sort of a friend or rival of his maid who was, his maid was sort of this uh, vain rich girl and Julie Brown would come on and she was also sort of like a, a vain character and they would sort of compete it's hard to explain which is very funny anyway from what i know of julie brown she was in a uh, slasher film from the early 80s uh, i forgot the name of the movie but i know she has like a topless scene in it which is hilarious she's she's famous for her sort of weird musical numbers like everybody run the homecoming queen has got a gun all right she she wrote earth girls are easy earth yes she wrote earth girls are easy and um, um she did a song attack of the five foot attack woman, of the five foot or five woman. one five foot one inch woman and um, um, and also the Madonna parody. That Medusa, she Dare to Be Stupid, and many, many, <laughs> many other things. Well, I wonder what she's doing now. Uh, she's still doing something. I just saw something on YouTube where she was doing a parody of something. She still looks the same too. Um, and then last on our list, we have um, which connects back to Seinfeld. We have Larry David, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Right. The uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm started as just like a one show, a one-off thing that they were doing, and then the HBO people said, "Let's make a show out of it." So he introduced all these characters. He played himself, but he had other people playing different uh, characters that were real, like his agent and his wife and his agent's wife and all this stuff. The humor is very similar to the Seinfeld TV show where in, you have this like cir circular plot and logic. Uh, the narrative is very similar, but it's improvised. It seems like it is. They're either improvising or they're really fantastically natural uh, actors and comedians. This will be like, uh, this is a... Uh, Toward the end of the show, we'll talk about the the what, what what's called retro, retro scripting, script. right? Yeah. Uh, Mystery Science Theater three thousand, which is a favorite of mine, uh, pl uh, stars Joel Hodgson playing a fictionalized version of himself, Joel Robinson, and uh, Joel Hodgson started as a kind of a prop cops prop comic slash magician, also kind of just funny, weird kind of stuff that he would come up with, like um, he put a telephone on a um, on a thin uh, pole and he said 
he would get he would lie down on the stage and say this is the invisible man answering a phone call and you hear a ring and then he picks up the phone with the pole and it says hello or or he'll wear like a batman costume and then tell everyone to uh to slant over uh and look at him and he would look like he was climbing up a building or something like like adam <laughs> west so uh, during the show's invention exchange, he would showcase inventions that were part of his stand-up act. Unfortunately, this opens up a whole conversation about prop comics that we really don't want to get into because this is not about prop comics. And I <laughs> never really found people like Gallagher and Carrot Top funny, but they were popular. Plus, it's really hard to do an audio clip of someone with a prop comic. doesn't really work I, too I don't well. understand. There's a whole <laughs> rant in Mystery Science. Joel Hodgson had like a fierce rivalry with Gallagher because apparently Gallagher stole some of his props right out of his trunk when they were performing together. And there's a whole rant about how people pay good money to have watermelons sprayed all over them. Okay, so from from a television situation, comedies were going on to comedy feature films and um, that played in theater and also HBO, HBO specials. Now, they were, this is the heyday of the 80s and 90s. Right. Uh, when everyone was doing this, but. So we mentioned, um, earlier we mentioned George Carlin and we talked about a bunch of those that we liked a lot, including Carlin on campus, Carlin at Carnegie, um, a big feature film that was popular that I watched over and over on cable, and you probably did too, with Bill Cosby himself. Right. Uh, that A lot of that material wound up on The Cosby Show. I remember that whole this whole uh, thing about uh, when his wife was going into labor and he took her to the hospital, and this appears in the pilot of The Cosby Show where he's trying to coach the dad Whose, whose wife is about to have their child, and he's like, push him out, shove him out, <laughs> way out. So, but Bill Cosby himself was actually shot in 81, not released until 83. I guess it didn't do very well in uh, theaters, but it became an enormous thing on cable. So, Yeah. Um, a Stephen Wright special, which uh, you got something for me on that one? Yeah, I do. All right. If you shoot a mime, should you use a silencer? My grandmother was also insane. She had pierced hearing aids. <laughs> Unscented perfume. Came in a little empty bottle. <laughs> then I tried to hang myself with bungee cord. I kept almost dying. And then I went into a store and I tried to buy something to put underneath the coasters. My uncle was a clown for Ringling Brothers Circus. And when he died, all his friends went to the funeral in one car. <laughs> I'm going to court next week. I have been selected for jury duty. It's kind of an insane case. 6,000 ants dressed up as rice and robbed a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> I couldn't find a a, a, a fun a, a, a good one that he did. He he does like these like weird plan word gag type things, and also his deadpan humor. And he also appeared in Natural Born Killers. I remember he was the prison psychiatrist. Oh, okay. Sure. And he has a really funny line in the movie where he says um, something like, uh, um, "I never listen when women talk to me." <laughs> But that I think that that was all improvised. Uh, also, he had a. Uh, I think the gag was uh, when they ship styrofoam. What do they pack it in? <laughs> um, I like the one about you know, he went into his apartment and realized everything had been replaced with an exact replica of itself. <laughs> something like that. Anyway, I'm going to go through the rest of these. Stop me if you want to make a note of something. Um, we have an evening with Robin Williams. That was uh, yes. San Francisco, 1982. I remember that. And also he did a, a show, uh, another show in 86 at the Met. And that was a funny one, too. The Roseanne Barr Show, not to be confused with Roseanne, well, but the I Roseanne Barr Show. What was a, that? A comedy, like a stand-up comedy special, not her TV oh, okay. show. Okay. Right. Whoopi Goldberg, direct from Broadway. That was very good. I remember that. Um, that was more her playing different characters. But anyway, um one that I watched with you, which was Eddie Izzard, Dressed to Kill. Very, very funny and also informative and educational. It was like a history <laughs> lesson, but he was making... Eddie Izzard is like a guy who has so much energy. He's like Robin Williams in that way. He's just running around and just rambling off like crazy. 
Um, and then another one that's not anywhere near as popular as it should be, which is, or he's not anywhere near as popular as he just deserves to be, who is Jake Johansson. This will take about an hour. Now, Jake Johansson, I did not remember until I remembered this gag that we're going to play, which is a very funny little gag about toast. And, uh, and also, we didn't, uh, I didn't notice the, this before. I looked at, in the, uh, I guess, the Wikipedia, and it said that Jake Johansson was Jerry Seinfeld's original choice to play George Costanza on Seinfeld. Really? That would have been completely different. I think what he's looking for is that grouchy kind of guy. Curmudgeon with problems and stuff like that. But the thing is, you know, as funny as Jake Johansson is, I don't know that he'd be able to pull it off because really, I mean, you cannot look at Jason Alexander and not think George Costanza in some way. Mm. He's just sort of like that. I remember there was a movie that Jason Alexander was in where he played a gay character. And I forgot the name of it. Patrick Stewart was in it too, I think. I'm not he's sure. He's a... What was the name of it? It was a popular stage play that became a movie, and he plays a gay character, a homosexual character, but he's a homosexual George Costanza. Really? No, yes. I mean, you just cannot get past George Costanza. He's kind of, like, cursed in a way. He was a little it's too good at the part. Is the Seinfeld good? curse. So this is Jake Johansson. This will <laughs> but take back to Jake Johansson. And this is his classic gag about toast. I've been having uh, troubles with my toaster lately. If everything else wasn't bad enough, I got just the automatic pop-up thing went bad on it. So you put the toast in, then push the lever. Down. Well, technically, you don't put toast in the toaster. I mean, if I had toast, I wouldn't need the toaster. So, I, uh, exactly. I put bread, key ingredient of toast, into the toaster. And, uh, well, I'm proud. I, uh, don't even have to look at the recipe anymore. <laughs> so I uh, put the bread in there, and uh, the thing that's broken is the automatic pop-up, which is the first thing to go bad on the toaster, and not counting the darkness control knob, <laughs> just because I don't think that's hooked up to anything from the beginning. So, <laughs> so, you know, that's like some kind of Fisher Price control that they put on this. I'm making the toast darker. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah, they might as well put a steering wheel on the toaster. So I I get the bread in there and then I try and time it. I go off in the other room and put my socks on, or some toast on task. Because <laughs> uh, I don't know exactly how long it takes to make toast, except that it's definitely longer than it's interesting to stare into a toaster. Uh, for me, anyway, once the wires get orange, the show's over. So, um, I, uh... I'm in the other room, put my socks on, and I get all distracted by my feet, you know. This little piggy went to market, this little piggy stayed home. I love that song. And uh, I forget all about the toast until I smell smoke coming from the kitchen. I run in, and there's fire coming out of the toaster, which is kind of a surreal sight to see flames coming out of those slots. And yet I felt strangely calm. Um, just because really at that point there's no scraping the toast. I, uh, once the bread ignites, uh, pretty much have to start over. Uh, so I uh, extinguish the fire, and then, uh, and then I, I tried to fix the toaster, which I don't know why I thought I could fix a toast. It was a guy thing. I thought, I, you know, I, I'm a guy, I can fix it, I'm bigger than it. <laughs> I, so I go right for the screws on the bottom, and they know that's right where you're going because they put that warning on that, don't take these screws out. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that's for someone else. <laughs> Get the toaster open, and I, I realize what, I have no idea what I was hoping to find in there. It looks like a shoelace untied. Maybe I could fix that. <laughs> Snowman with his hat blown off. <laughs> Let me get that for you, little fella. That must have been it. So, it's neither one of those things, so I have to go 
to buy a new toaster to the toaster store where the salesman of course wants me to buy the biggest toast machine he's got right the v8 rocket toaster <laughs> way more toaster than i need <laughs> and his next step was to try and sell me the eight slice toaster like i'm gonna have the brady bunch over for toast <laughs> Here's a story of a lovely lady. They all wanted their toast at the exact same time. When do you need eight slices of toast? No! <laughs> I tell him, I don't want that. And then, finally, he sells me the toaster for me, which was a one-slice toaster, about a foot long, but an extra wide, too, in case they invent some new kind of bread. I don't have to upgrade my toaster. Uh, just because you know the Japanese are working on some new bread right now to make our toasters obsolete. They're over there with the wide loaf, high resolution toast. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. And then last on my list is another one we, we watched together um, Louis Black, Black on Broadway. Another guy uh, uh, influenced. Uh, heavily by Bill Hicks also. I mean, because he smokes and he's wearing the leather jacket as well. But Louis Black is kind of curmudgeon -y. I mean, he's a lot older. He's not yeah. a, young, a young man. And he started, I think, on The Daily Show. He was a correspondent mm -hmm. on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart where he would do his rants on, on, on the desk and that's how he became... I don't think he started... I mean, I think he was around before that. He also appeared on, on Homicide. He was, he was on Homicide? Just, what, like a one episode... Yeah. As an, he, he played a part? He played a role. He, he acted. He played a suspect on Homicide. Was he dramatic or something? He was or? dramatic, yeah. Wow. He must have been a friend of Belzer's. Uh, I'm thinking. So this is Louis Black. This is a funny bit on milk. I flew back from, uh, from Los Angeles, and on the plane was a Time magazine. And there was a 30-page article about diabetes. And I read every page. And by the time that plane landed, I had diabetes. <laughs> And for all we study about health, we know nothing. Is milk good or bad? I rest my case. <laughs> you don't know. You don't know anymore. And a lot of you were sitting there thinking, fuck, I'm an adult. I don't have to drink that shit anymore. <laughs> when I was a kid, you knew milk was good. Because there was only one kind of milk, moo cow fuck milk, and that was it. <laughs> and you had to drink four glasses a day. Now you don't know. Because when you go down the, the aisle of the grocery store, there's milk, the milk aisle goes on for fucking ever. There's 1%, 2%, low fat, skim, acidophilus milk. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Sidophilus milk, milk doesn't need a friend. That shit belongs in the yogurt section. Lactose intolerant milk, kiss my dick. <laughs> if you're lactose intolerant, you can't drink milk. So what's in the fucking cart? <laughs> Get it out of there. Get it away from my milk. It is talking to my milk and making it feel bad about itself. <laughs> but that, was, that was a very funny... Actually, that is one of the funniest uh, shows. Black on Broadway. It isn't just the milk. He talks about everything. It's, I love his bit about water, drinking water. Uh, one of my favorite things is the uh, uh, doctors recommend that you eat, drink uh, eight glasses of water a day. Uh, doctors also recommend if you don't, if you can't drink eight glasses of water a day, at the end of the week, you should just get a garden hose and stick it right up your ass. <laughs> look at me, look at me. My pee has no color. I love that one. So uh, this is the influential Bill Hicks that we're going to talk about. Now, you didn't know that much about Bill Hicks, but you said that when you saw his routine, he, he, he seemed familiar to you. I've definitely seen him um, on television, yeah. Um, now, this bit is from the David Letterman show from 1993. He did the bit, but it was removed 
uh, by stand. It wasn't removed by standards and practices. It was actually a couple of people took blame for this because the 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 routine was a little bit controversial, I guess, for even for late night television. Uh, one of the producers said they took it out at the last minute, and then David Letterman actually came out with uh, uh, he had Mary Hicks, who was Bill Hicks' mother. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Um, and he basically took responsibility for it, and he said he regretted it, he didn't want to do it. But this is part of that, that bit from 1993. I don't know what my deal is. I'm like a 31-year-old curmudgeon, that's the deal. You know, I went to a dance club the other day, you know, and uh, dragged against my will, you know. And this girl asked me to dance, which I thought was hilarious, you know. Would you like to dance? You know, I'm like, yeah, you read my mind, you know. <laughs> that's why I'm leaning in the darkest corner closest to the exit, you know. Uh, <laughs> I'm about to boogie. I'm about to cut a rug. But it's weird. Women have this weird myth. You can tell the way a guy is in bed by how he is on a dance floor. I think that's ridiculous. What does it matter? You know what I mean? If a guy is on a dance floor really getting into it, enjoying himself, expressing himself, what does it matter how he is in bed? He's gay. <laughs> Real men don't dance, they sit, sweat, and curse. <laughs> Speaking of homosexuality, uh, you know, I consider myself fairly open-minded, but something has come to my attention I find absolutely shocking. I don't know if you've heard about it. These new grade school books for children to teach them gay lifestyles. You know what I'm talking about? One of them is called Heather's Two Mommies. The other is called Daddy's New Roommate. I'm going to have to draw the line here, folks, and say this is absolutely disgusting, okay? It is <laughs> grotesque and evil. I'm talking about Daddy's new roommate. Uh, Heather's Two Mommies is pretty cool. I don't know if you want to check that out. So. They're hugging on page seven. Oh, <laughs> go, mommies, go, go. Anyway, it makes me miss my youth. <laughs> so, uh, Bill Hicks did not get the kind of acclaim or attention um, that he surely deserved because he died uh, from pancreatic cancer in February of 94. That was the very next year right after that was recorded, and he was 32 years old. Wow, that's very young. Well, you can sort of see, I mean, that, that bit is interesting because of it's not, it's definitely... Um, the controversy would have come from what? The fact that it's not very PC regarding uh, gay lifestyles, you think? Uh, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he has a Louis C.K. feel to him. I mean, if you listen okay. to Louis C.K. now, I mean, like, he's... Uh, Louis C.K. is very... He doesn't care what you think. He just shoots his mouth off, and, and Bill Hicks is very much like that. <laughs> 